This meeting is being recorded. There you go. So welcome everybody to our <clears throat> uh, webinar this evening about um, what's in our bins. Um, everyone is, been, is going to be asked to stay on mute throughout the session, please, just because there are quite a few of us and it just makes it easier to manage. But if you have any questions at all, pop them in the chat and we will have time at the end for a Q&A um, so we can dive into them at the end. Um, as you know, the session is being recorded. This is so that we can make a link available to recording afterwards for anyone that hasn't been able to make it today. We've got a few that are sadly busy tonight. Um, if you don't want to be visible, then please change your screen view so we can't see you and just be aware that your name may still be visible. Hopefully for many of you, that will be absolutely fine. So just check in. I don't need to let anyone else in, which I don't. So we are the Heart of a Cheer Waste Partnership. Um, and the partnership is uh, all 11 Hertfordshire councils, so that's the districts, boroughs and the county. We were set up in 1992, aiming to reduce waste and encourage recycling. Between us, the 11 councils are responsible for providing waste management services to over 1.1 million residents in 490,000 households across the county. And the, waste, the HWP, um, our waste aware team, of which I am one of the coordinators and David is the other, seeks to reduce waste by encouraging positive behaviour change in all residents. So there are three speakers tonight, myself, David and our manager, Duncan. Duncan Jones is a chartered resources and waste manager, as well as a member of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management. With over 26 years experience, he covers a range of disciplines from client side roles through to senior leadership positions in direct service organizations, successfully working across two tier structures. So that's the county as well as districts and boroughs. As well as being the partnership development manager for the Hertfordshire Waste Partnership, Duncan is chairman of the award winning fly, Hertfordshire Fly Tipping Group, which is a multi agency task force. Um, and in, in addition to the 11 local authorities within Hertfordshire, it also includes the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner, the Hertfordshire Constabulary, Hertfordshire Fire and Rescue, the Environment Agency and the National Farmers Union. So that's a little bit about Dun Duncan. Um, on to David. So David Burley has a 40 year career which began in the voluntary sector before a move to the Home Office where he helped to set up the charity Crime Concern, which is now called Catch-22. He then joined Friends of the Earth in 1990 to develop the pioneering Recycling City initiative before moving on to becoming a trainer at RAPS Recycling Managers course. In 2012, sorry, he took time out to work as a protocol manager at the London 2012 Olympic Games before then joining Broxbourne Council where he became senior recycling officer. And then over lockdown in April 2020, he joined the Hertfordshire Waste Partnership as our second Waste Aware Coordinator. And then a quick word about me. So I've been in the industry for 16 years um, and I've always been passionate about making the best use of resources possible. This passion was cemented early on during a visit to a landfill site during my environmental science degree and seeing the pris pristine items that some people threw away. Eight years in the waste and resources team at Hertfordshire, sorry, Hampshire County Council followed before a relocation brought me to Hertfordshire um, and my current role as the other waste away coordinator. And I support many of the public engagement campaigns that the partnership runs, and you'll hear some more about that towards the end of the presentation. Which brings us to the presentation. So what are we considering tonight? We are looking at, sorry, just letting someone else in. What is in our bins? Um, how much waste there is? Where did it go? How good are we at recycling? And what are we doing to try and reduce it? So I will now pass you on to Duncan, who is going to kick us off. Can we see Duncan? Now, I've put everybody on mute, and what I might have done is also muted Duncan. Yes, I have. Apologies, everyone. Not a good start. Here we go. Sorry, Duncan. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Helena, thank you for the introduction. David, could I have the next slide, please? So, um, just to start things off tonight, to put things in context, um, each of these graphs here uh, numerically um, illustrate in one form or another, the types of waste that the Hearts Waste Partnership, the HWP, manages on behalf of Hertfordshire residents. 
starting in the top left hand uh, corner there, the graph of the purple line. Um, that is uh, an expression of the total household waste. So this is your recycling, your organics, your composting, and your residual waste. You add it together and then expressed as a kilograms per household calculation. On the left-hand side of the graph, um, we have uh, the year 2010-11, all the way out to provisional figures for the year um, that has just finished, 21-22. You can see for total household waste that throughout the duration, um, the general trend was, was a downward trend, which is exactly what we want to see. One of the measures that we look at uh, in terms of judging how effective we are across our entire waste program is to see a, a reducing total household waste figure per household um, as, we, as we go on. However, as you can also see, towards the right-hand side of the graph, there's that very nasty little kick around 2019-20. That is the impact of the pandemic. Overnight, uh, commercial wastes, the commercial waste sector largely shut down. So for example, we weren't going out to restaurants. We weren't going out for business lunches. We weren't going out for uh, breakfast. We were having three meals a day at home. And as a result, we were shopping appropriately. Um, as a consequence, the amount of household waste um, in, in terms of total household waste went up very, very significantly to the extent that it drew into question uh, waste generation models that we've been building for the previous 30 years. So uh, a very unwelcome impact from the pandemic. The hash line, the dotted line that you can see from 2021 to 2122 is our prediction for the year that's just finished. Um, waste, is, waste is all about um, facts and figures. And so it will take another couple of months before we're happy that the 21-22 year challenges have been properly audited uh, before we can finalize and make that a solid line. But the prediction is that we've once again got total household waste back down on a downward trend, which is most welcome. Moving across to the top right, the red line there, now that is residual waste, simply residual waste. That doesn't include the recycling um, or the composting. This is the stuff that people either don't compost or don't recycle plus some of the stuff that we buy and consume that isn't actually recyclable, that goes into our residual waste, both collected at the curbside, um, as well as through the um, household waste recycling centers. Uh, and you can see it's a very similar story here. We have a nice downward trend for the majority of the period in question. And then again, as a result of the pandemic, we have that nasty little kick um, from 2019-20 to 2021 uh, before we resume a downward trend. And we're hoping once we finalize the figures for 21-22, that we can get residual waste per household back to um, pre-pandemic levels, which would be most welcome. Bottom left-hand side, you've got dry recyclables and organics. This is the stuff we again collect both at the curbside and at the household recycling centers across the county. And you can see the blue line there, that represents the dry recycling. And you can see that upward kick at the start of the pandemic as a result of many more people um, uh, shopping a lot more to because they were in their home seven days a week and we won't go out anywhere. And actually the, the organics um, line is the green line. That actually reflects that we actually collected a lot more organic waste that, uh, compared to recent years as people had not a lot to do um, when they weren't working. So we noticed a lot more people spending a lot more time in their gardens, um, tending to the gardens, generating more garden waste. And then moving across to the right hand side, we have the recycling rate from 2006, seven, sorry, 2010-11, all the way up to 2021. Um, and last year we topped out at 52. Point, um, I think it was 52.3%, 51.4%, .4%, um, which is our highest recycling rate ever. And the provisional figures for this year indicate that we may be pushing up towards the 53% level. Next slide, please. So this infographic here really is designed to summarize the key numbers for the audience tonight. So starting top left, um, 11 refers to the 11 partner authorities. So we have each of the 10 boroughs and districts as waste collection authorities and the county council as a waste disposal authority. We spend on your behalf um, almost 19 million pounds a year. Uh, 45 million pounds of that is on waste treatment and disposal with the balance 44 and a half million pounds being spent on waste collection and street cleansing. The graphic on the top right there illustrates the size of the increase that we experienced during 2021 as the pandemic um, um, 
it started to impact on waste generation. Uh, bottom left, in total, you add those three waste streams together in terms of tons. Uh, we managed on your behalf just short of uh, 514,000 tons. Now that can be somewhat of a meaningless figure if you don't work in the industry. So to give you some idea of what that actually looks like, I have two equivalents for you. If you think of the old 747 jumbo jet, um, if you look at the average weight of one of those and divide that into that tonnage figure there, we handled the equivalent of 2,747 747s um, in terms of overall weight. If you prefer in animals, um, based on an African bush elephant, a male being around about the seven ton mark, the tonnage we handled in 2021 is equivalent to just shy of 73,400 African bull elephants to try and give you some idea of shape and size. Um, I mentioned the recycling rate, 52.4%. Uh, but perhaps one of the most interesting graphics for me here is the is the third from the third from the left on the bottom row there, in that the amount of waste that we actually sent to landfill um, was no more than about 15%. So from every 100 tons of household waste, no more than 15% went to landfill, with the vast majority dealt with either through recycling, composting, or existing uh, use of energy recovery. Um, and then we end there on the right-hand side with the four R's, which is our main focus. It's all about reduction, reuse, recycling, and energy recovery. Next slide, please. So where does our waste go? And for this, I will hand over to my colleague, David Burley. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Duncan. Uh, great, uh, great start, some very interesting uh, outlines there. And so let's start off our uh, examination of where Hertfordshire's waste goes by considering uh, what Duncan mentioned as a residual waste, the the forty seven percent or so of the material that goes into the rubbish bin, and is collected usually on a fortnightly basis uh, on a on a lorry like this with the bin guy uh, loading a wheelie bin at the back of the lorry. Uh, the, we're familiar with this sort of collection uh, from households all over the county. Where that material go? Uh, well, as Duncan pointed out, interestingly, um, much less than half of the residual waste actually goes to landfill. The greater part of it goes to energy from waste plants. And some of them are quite sophisticated, like this one uh, shown in the uh, picture in Buckinghamshire. Uh, and and uh, the great feature of the energy from waste plants is that the residual waste is incinerated, the heat from the incineration is used to power steam turbines, and they in turn generate electricity which is fed into the national grid. The landfill site, on the other hand, merely contains the waste. Now, the days of landfill sites blowing up because the methane gases haven't been uh, managed properly are happily long past us and the type of uh, landfill site that uh, Hertfordshire supplies are very well managed and they're landscaped and gradually they are returned to farmland and recreational land. Uh, and um, we can be confident that the, the sites are uh, properly managed and very tightly regulated under successive environmental protection legislation. There is an important feature of the way in which we manage the residual waste in Hertfordshire, and that is that very little of it is managed in the county itself. As you can see from this map, well, while the material is concentrated uh, in the, the colored dots show the location of transfer stations where the bin lorries that we saw in the photograph earlier um, empty and the material is compacted and loaded onto even larger vehicles. But after that, the, the material leaves the county. It doesn't go that far, it doesn't go abroad, but it does go to neighboring uh, local authority areas, Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, and uh, to the Edmonton facility in Enfield in North London. And you may ask why these facilities are not available in Hertfordshire. And the answer is that, um, there have been concerted efforts to develop uh, waste facilities in Hertfordshire, 
um, including um, in, including a, an initiative in the well in the Hatfield area to build an energy from waste plant, and a similar initiative uh, in in the Hoddesdon area of Broxbourne. Uh, but these initiatives failed. Um, the the uh, promoters of the initiatives, the the, uh, the contracting partner uh, chosen by the county council, was not able to secure planning permission and was not able to overcome public opposition to the proposals to, um, uh, to, to build uh, energy from waste plants within the county. So at the moment, the material uh, is exported into, into neighboring into neighboring authorities. Turning now to the organic type of waste, uh, and again, um, this is a relatively straightforward uh, story. Um, I think many of us will be familiar with the type of food waste collections that you can see uh, illustrated on the left of the picture there. Uh, these are usually weekly. Most authorities in Hertfordshire now have a weekly food waste collection uh, in, a, in a usually a 20 to 23 litre container placed at the boundary of the property and collected in a small vehicle like the one illustrated. And then on the right hand side are the, again, um, more familiar large garden waste type vehicle, uh, uh, essentially a, 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 an adapted uh, bin lorry, but this time for, for, for collecting uh, garden waste. So a small number of councils in Hertfordshire collect mixed garden waste and food waste. It's a diminishing number. Uh, uh, and they will also collect that mixed waste in a, in a vehicle like the one on the right hand side. What happens to this material? If it's simply garden waste without any food waste in it, um, it is simply windrowed, a, a process which is actually very similar to a home compost heap, only on a much larger industrial scale. So in the top illustration there, you can see material that has been garden waste that has been shredded and then simply arrayed in a line, turned over mechanically uh, on a regular basis, perhaps occasionally watered, uh, partly to um, facilitate the composting process, partly to prevent the escape of uh, windblown material and uh, smells and things like that. But essentially it's a very simple process with simply mechanical uh, turning over of the material from time to time to produce a, a friable, um, very acceptable compost, which is used mainly on uh, local agricultural, uh, for local agricultural purposes, but occasionally um, Hertfordshire councils, including St Albans, for example, do offer free compost giveaways. Uh, and if you have an opportunity to go and get some of this very high quality compost that you may have generated from your own garden, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great way of getting something back, but do go early. Um, the compost giveaways that the councils offer, which are advertised on their social media uh, sites, are very much um, first come, first served, and material, even huge quantities of it, tends to go. I've, I've participated in some of these myself as an officer, and it's quite astonishing the rate at which the material is, is, uh, is eagerly taken away by local householders. So if you get a chance to go to one, do so, but get there early. Uh, where the material contains food waste, garden waste mixed with food waste, heat treatment will be necessary uh, beyond that which can occur naturally in the windrowing process. Uh, this is because food waste is assumed to contain meat and animal byproducts, even if it doesn't, uh, and the regulations require that waste containing animal byproducts uh, is heat treated to uh, prevent um, pathogenic um, uh, contamination uh, and uh, a, a repeat, for example, of the um, foot and mouth um, disease that we had um, 20 odd years ago, which was, which was traced to um, contaminated uh, pig swill. Um, and that led to uh, a tightening of the regulations governing the way in which uh, waste containing food is managed. And, and where uh, councils in Hertfordshire collect food waste mixed with um, garden waste, it will be treated in one of these in-vessel composting facilities which allow the, the necessary heat treatment to be applied. And then if it's pure uh, food waste, 
um, a, a remarkable um, a treatment is available for it. It's called anaerobic digestion. So in, in, in the absence of any oxygen in, a, in an enclosed system, the food will decay and give off methane and other gases. These are captured on site and used to uh, generate electricity, which in turn is passed into the national grid. And uh, the anaerobic digestion system is really uh, a sort of unsung and uncelebrated aspect of our renewable energy um, system, but um, a, a truly remarkable um, technical innovation. And, uh, and, and, and um, you, you know, uh, that there are at least 40 or so of these facilities in the United Kingdom, but many of us don't know very much about them. But um, in contrast with the uh, residual waste, um, the good news as well in the case of Hart Fisher is that almost all of the organic waste we've just been discussing is treated in the county. And the county has examples of all the types of uh, processing that we've just been discussing. Uh, there's a concentration of facilities south of St Albans actually, where Seven Trent Green Power operate both an anaerobic digestion facility providing uh, um, energy derived from the uh, decaying food for the national grid. And there is also nearby a, an in-vessel composting facility for those councils who are still collecting mixed garden and food waste. There's a similar facility in the north of the county serving uh, East and North Hertfordshire. And Broxbourne um, also has an energy, uh, a, a, an anaerobic digestion plant. Um, uh, and then just outside the county, literally just outside the county at uh, Cattlegate Farm. It is actually much closer to Hertfordshire than we've, shown, we've been able to show on the map. Uh, part of it, in fact, part of it is in Hertfordshire. Uh, and uh, there is an open windrowing system there for, for garden waste. There is also an anaerobic digestion plant on that site, but it's not currently used by any uh, Hertfordshire authorities. And then a small quantity of um, garden waste does go out of county to a facility pretty nearby in Suffolk, um, but essentially the, the treatment of, uh, of uh, garden waste and food waste in Hertfordshire is uh, a story of the material being successfully and imaginatively processed right on our doorstep. Now we come to the, to the most familiar, but actually the most complicated part of the story, which is what happens to the dry recycling, the plastics, cans, paper and cardboard and glass that we're familiar with. Uh, these sorts of materials can be, can be uh, saved for curbside collection uh, in any authority across Hertfordshire. There is a, um, a, a consistent uh, range of material collected across Hertfordshire. What varies a little bit from location to location is the containers that are provided um, uh, for, for the public to present the material for collection. Uh, in some areas, all the dry recyclables are collected in one big wheel bin. In, in other areas, some materials, particularly paper and glass, might be collected separately. But the same materials are collected in all the different authorities. What happens to it, though, is, is interesting, but slightly complicated. Um, it, the material will go to what's known as a materials reclamation facility or MRF. Um, we love uh, we love acronyms in the uh, in the waste industry, and this is one of our favourites. Um, and again, this is uh, these are examples of very high tech applications, um, often unsung and uh, un, un, uh, unknown as far as the, the general public are concerned. But uh, the typical MRF uh, combines. Um, a, a series of technological innovations. It will have um, it, 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 it will it will have light based systems for detecting different types of plastic. It will have eddy current separators, a sort of ionizing um, uh, um, uh, field created to to exclude aluminium products, and it will have a good old fashioned electromagnet to um, to extract the steel and um, cans and tins. Um, as well as other blowing uh, facilities to take different uh, materials off the, off, the, off the sorting lines. And you can see the, uh, the picture in the top left is of the Pierce uh, recycling plant uh, in St Albans. It, it um, only looks like that actually 
um, when they install some new <laughs> some new equipment and get a professional photographer in to take some pictures of it. Once it's been going for a month or two, uh, it begins to look a little more uh, shop shop soiled, perhaps. But um, nonetheless, it, we we have uh, on our on our doorstep a, a very sophisticated, state of the art sorting facility which can successfully segregate lots of different types of of material. But that's only half the story, because once the material has been segregated into the different types of plastic, the steel can separated from the aluminium, the glass and the paper and cardboard removed and bailed, um, it will then go off to other reprocessing facilities. Uh, and some of these reprocessing facilities might be abroad, because the, 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 the reprocessing of, of material to make new products is a truly international business. Um, and, and what happens to the materials that are, that are collected at the curbside depends on um, the nature of the material themselves. So, for example, plastics like PVC, uh, having been separated at the MRF, they'll go off to a plant which will, which will shred them, grade them, uh, clean them thoroughly, and then test them to make sure that they're of merchantable quality. And then they'll be um, sold in, in weighted loads um, back into the plastics industry to make new products. Um, the second picture here shows aluminium ingots, um, old aluminium cans melted down, filled into ingots, and then returned either to the, to the packaging industry to be made back into aluminium cans, often very, very quickly, very, it's a very quick turnaround, um, or made into other aluminium uh, industry products, you know, window frames and things like that. Paper we're all familiar with. It goes to it. Uh, the, the the paper is taken to paper mills, and huge reels are produced there. Um, that the paper may be mixed with new paper pulp. Uh, different grades of cardboard may be mixed together. It will produce reels of either paper or cardboard, and that will again go off to industry to be to be made into new paper products, uh, printer paper, cardboard packaging, and again some of that will be abroad because that's. Uh, the, if you're making cardboard packaging, you probably want to be near to where the products are going to be that you're going to package. And most of the sort of electronics and other consumer goods, of course, are these days made in the, in the Far East. So that's where uh, many of the paper and cardboard products may well go to be finished. And then the last picture here is glass colored. That's what happens to glass when it's been crushed and, uh, and uh, prepared. Uh, and that will that, that it will go from the MRF to a plant that will do that to it, and then it will go um, color separated, graded uh, to to the glass manufacturing industry, or in some cases to the um, asphalt industry to be mixed with uh, asphalt for road surfacing. Mainly, though, it will go back into um, into glass, and that that most of that does occur in the UK. Um, heavy commodity, obviously, and uh, relatively low value, so. Um, not much of an export uh, trend there. But so just so uh, re really, this is by way of uh, just alerting everyone to the fact that the, the recycling process, the dry recycling process in particular, is a complex one. And therefore, it's not a surprise, perhaps, that quite significant flows go across the world. Nonetheless, um, by far, the greater proportion of material is collected uh, uh, is, is reprocessed at home. As you can see, 85% of the, of the recyclable materials that are collected in Hertfordshire are reprocessed in the home market. And, and two thirds of it, although the figure obviously is bumped up heavily by the organic fraction, for example, that we've just been discussing, but two thirds of, two -thirds of the material that's collected from Hertfordshire councils is reprocessed actually in Eastern and, and Southern England, less than a, you know, within less than a hundred mile radius of, uh, of, of the country. County. There are significant exports. We were just referring to some of them. Um, paper in particular, paper and cardboard in particular, uh, are, 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 are high exports uh, in order to be finished into new products. Plastics actually less so. We have a we have a we have a successful plastics recycling industry in the United Kingdom. Again, perhaps not uh, widely appreciated. Uh, and, uh, and the notion that plastics all goes off to some hole in the ground somewhere in Turkey where it's burned under unregulated circumstances, it's certainly emphatically not the case in Hertfordshire. Um, we know what happens to our waste, we track it, 
and uh, and we um, and we are confident that the material that's collected um, is, is being processed correctly. And how do we know this? Uh, we know this because we take very seriously a government obligation to track the waste. And so uh, we are in touch with the MRFs, the the, the, fact, the factories that are separating all the different materials that we've just been looking at. But we're not just in touch with the MRFs, we're in touch with the next stage as well, where the material is turned into, into something that can be used for new products. That's the point at which we consider it's reached its end destination the reprocessing company that, that turns it into something that can go back into the marketplace to make new products. And, and we, can, we can log those, uh, those uh, transactions um, to quite a level of detail. Uh, and we um, are working on ways of making this information freely available to the public in an, in an attractive and graphic way. Uh, and this time next year, if, we, if we're presenting to SuskFest, uh, I hope we'll be able to show you uh, and indeed invite you to click on um, the sort of graphic representation of the uh, of, of how we're managing the materials. Right, well, that's a, a little lightning tour of the world as to, to demonstrate what, what, where the waste actually is reprocessed and hopefully to, to um, scotch one or two myths about the extent to which the material is sent overseas. But how good are we at doing this? Um, I'm going to hand back to one of my colleagues now uh, to carry on with the story of um, how successful we are at our recycling. Thank you, David. Could you have the uh, next slide put up, please? Thank you. So um, all those different collection services that David spoke about um, have a, both a, a, a rationale in law, so there are statutory responsibilities that are put on the boroughs and districts and, and, and as collection authorities and different statutory duties that are placed on the county council as Hertfordshire's waste disposal authority. But one of the things common to all partner authorities is the need to understand what it is we actually collect. And in doing so, we start to put together the, the basis for a discussion around policy and strategy with our elected members which ultimately results in the services that you receive as residents, whether those are curbside collection services for the three streams that David talked about, or for the services uh, that you will see operating uh, across the, the County Council's network of recycling centres. So how do we do this? Well, it sounds a little bit dull, a little bit academic, but it's something that um, colleagues like myself, David and Helen, find uh, eminently uh, uh, exciting we start with a waste compositional analysis and as you can see from the picture behind the text there compositional analysis involves the sampling of uh, statistically significant um, parts of the waste stream we take it to a large uh, facility in this case a large shed um, near to our waterdale transfer station and a team of um, analytical pickers will literally pick apart uh, the contents of your of your uh, residual bin, your recycling bin, um, <coughs> which, is, which is what we concentrated on in this case, as well as litter. Um, and they would divide it um, up into around 55 different categories. Now, there are a number of service providers that do this work. Uh, and, and the good thing is, is that they all work to, to a common standard um, uh, to ensure that there is the ability to compare such studies across the UK. So we last undertook a composition analysis in 2020. Uh, we ran it from September to October um, of 2020. Um, we had planned to run it in the, the uh, spring of 2020, but obviously the pandemic started. So we had to put enough distance between um, us and the start of the pandemic and the strange behaviors that that was creating, but not get too close to the festive period for 2021, 20, as that too would have been an atypical <laughs> So during, uh, during September, uh, the samples were collected. Then during October, uh, the analysis was undertaken. And we did it for three reasons. One, to fundamentally understand what's in our residual waste, um, particularly in response to some changes in legislation that are about to hit us, to understand the amount of post-consumer packaging that the HWP handles, both in the residual waste stream and in the recycling waste stream. And, and as I said in the bottom bullet point there, to help shape future waste policy to make sure that the recommendations we make as officers to elected members with respect to 
the services that you uh, receive are, are properly configured to reflect what's actually going on. So I'm now going to take you some of those key highlights. So David, next slide, please. So this slide here, uh, this illustration, this gives you a very, very basic breakdown of what is in our residual waste bins. This is the stuff that goes to for disposal. And you can see that just over half of that is non-recyclable. That is waste for which we currently do not have a recycling option. Many different wastes are, most wastes are technically recyclable. However, in order to uh, fund and create and sustain a proper waste management system, you have to have viable end markets for the stuff that you collect as recycling. Um, and therefore, some of the stuff that we throw away in our, our residual waste cannot currently be recycled. And that's represented there by the, the gray part of that pie chart. The green part is organics. Uh, so this is the stuff that could be composted um, um, uh, or actually avoided because most of that green um, slice of the pie chart there is what we refer to as uh, avoidable food waste. And I'll come on to that in more detail in a minute. But most of that is food waste and most of that element is avoidable. Doesn't need to be in the residual bin whatsoever. Um, with a small smattering of stuff that could be put out for the composting collection as well. The orange or the brown uh, segment, depending on your eyesight, just under 18% there, um, is the dry recyclables that are left in our residual waste, which could have been recycled at the curbside in Hertfordshire. So the key takeaway here uh, when you're talking to your friends and colleagues about some of these facts and figures you're hearing tonight is that just over half of what's in, sorry, just under just under half of what's in our residual waste bins does not need to be there. It can be recycled or it can be composted or it can be avoided in the first place. Next slide, please, David. This uh, graphic here um, is a slightly more complex representation of the one you've just seen. Again, we have the three elements to it, um, the non-recyclables, the dry recycling and the orange and the organic waste fractions. A couple of key takeaways here. You can see that there is a significant um, level of non-recyclable compostables uh, and non-recyclable paper, glass, glass and textiles and metals that ends up in the residual waste stream at just under 24% there. If you go to the bottom of the graph, you can see that actually almost a quarter of, of what's in our residual waste is avoidable, avoidable food waste. So this is food, where, this is food that has been purchased and has never been used. Uh, current estimations from an organization called RAP, that's the Waste Resources and Action Program, it's a government quango that studies this sort of stuff and helps, uh, help, helps to inform national policy, uh, estimates that if you think of uh, the purchase of food in terms of three shopping bags, on average, one of those shopping bags is thrown away without ever being used, either because it's gone out of date uh, or because people have forgotten they've got it, or, or plans have changed. But for whatever reason, uh, one out of three shopping bags of food is thrown away and never used. And prior to the current cost of living crisis, um, the estimation was that that would cost the average family 700 pounds a year. And funny enough, so it's 700 pounds is the estimated additional uh, power bills and energy bills that most households across the UK are now facing as a result of the recent increase in the cap. Um, I mentioned that was the costing prior to uh, the cost of living crisis. Current research is indicating that, that that third of food waste that's never utilized will start to cost uh, families on average about 800 pounds a year. So a very significant issue. Um, and one that we will talk about more in a minute. Next slide, please, David. Capture rates. So one of the things we are really, really interested in, in determining by analyzing both our residual waste and our recycling collections at the same time from the same household and the sampling is to determine how much we're capturing of each of the key materials. And the five material streams you see on this graph here uh, are also the ones that are due to be specified in law by the government in something we call the consistency regulations, which is part of the resources and waste strategy. Um, and we'll speak a bit more about that towards the end of the presentation. But we're keen to determine what is the capture rate. So if we look at glass on the left hand side there, back in 2015, as denoted by the blue bar there, we could calculate by analyzing um, the, both the residual and recycling stream together that we were capturing at the time over 86%, just under 87% of the household glass. 
in 2020, that capture rate went up to 92.5%, one of the highest rates I've ever seen. And whilst it's not job done in terms of glass, it shows us that if you have to prioritize, for example, a budget to target materials that were not recycled, glass wouldn't necessarily be the, the material you go after because we've already got a high capture rate. And actually we start to look at some of the, the bars or the columns um, towards the right hand side of the graph. But the key takeaway here is that if you compare 2020 to 2015, you can see in every single case, our capture rate has improved. We are getting better at capturing more of the material that's being put out in the waste stream, which is why we, we if, not that we will, but if, if you can remember that pie chart, it was under 20%. And that's reflective of the fact that we've improved our capture rates um, across, um, over the last, um, the intervening period that these two analyses were, were, were done. Next slide, please, David. So a um, couple of other key and interesting issues that throw up significant policy um, issues for officers to talk about uh, and make recommendations to members. This graph, similarly to the last slide, shows the capture rates for our current garden waste system. And there are two colors shown on the graph. Uh, and if we were doing this to a live audience, I would, I would challenge the audience to tell me what they think the difference is. And quite often the answers are weird and wonderful. But very simply, the boroughs here that are shown in the orange um, color or brown, depending on your computer screen, are those authorities in Hertfordshire which currently charge for the household collection of garden waste. The households or the sorry, the authorities shown in blue do not charge for garden waste collection. And this is a key issue here. So if we if, if we uh, well, or look, did not, Duncan, actually, isn't it? It did not at the time of the chart because of course St. Albans do now. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Just bearing in mind the audience. The time, in mind the, audience. Done, <laughs> the, time the analysis was done. Now, the reason I, I emphasize this is that if you looked at the numbers, these numbers represent the fact that for those that at the time of the analysis, to pick up David's point quite correctly, those that do not charge captured 97.6% of the garden waste in the entire waste stream. A very good capture rate, 97.6%. For those that did charge, the capture rate was 97.1%, a 0.5% difference. From an officer's apolitical perspective, that only results in a single recommendation. In a, in a world where austerity for the last 10 years continues to impact on local government budgets and will deal with the foreseeable future, the statistics and the analysis that sit behind this particular graph only draw a single conclusion for officers, and that is to recommend to members that they implement a charging system for garden waste, as we currently can do under the law. Um, that said, government, for various reasons, is currently considering the future ability for local authorities to charge for this element. And once the uh, consistency regulations go live, the receiver all are sent to become live, there is a possibility that local authorities will no longer be able to charge for this particular element. In Hertfordshire, in response to three years of consultation exercises, at all times we have stated that we believe local authorities should retain the individual right to decide for themselves based on local circumstances, which is why you have two different approaches currently in the county. Next slide, please, David. Okay, sticking with capture, this one now looks at food waste. And again, um, to pick up David's point, this is the position at 2020 when the analysis was done. If we were redoing that um, analysis today, we'd also be adding in blue bars for Well and Hatfield and Watford, um, who kicked off their food waste collections in September 2020 and November 2020. Watford weren't actually part of the 2020 analysis because they had done a very similar study with the same company um, the year before in preparation for the launch of a new service. But where we can, we've added in their results. But here, at the time of the analysis being done, five of the 10 authorities were collecting food waste. And you can see here, St. Albans uh, was out in front with almost a 60% capture rate 
for food waste, um, going down to uh, lower levels in some of the other boroughs. Um, food waste is by far, as you'll see in a second, the biggest element left in the residual waste stream and is something that we are featuring very heavily on, as you'll see in the rest of this presentation. Uh, David, next slide, please. So what's left to reduce and recycle? So this graph here, sorry, this graph, this table applies the headline results from the composition analysis and then looks at our residual waste streams. And by applying the percentages to the tonnage, we can work out how much is left to go and capture. Um, and you can see here, the, the one I've circled that has real importance is the food waste. In fact, if you were add up add up the tonnages against paper, plastics, carbon glass cans and garden waste, add them together, they wouldn't come anywhere near the food waste tonnage that's in our residual waste stream. And, and for me, as, a, as someone that advises Hertfordshire elected members, both at the borough and district and county level, as well as nationally through professional associations, both in terms of waste strategy, uh, in terms of cost, and more importantly, in terms of wider climate change considerations, food waste for me has to be the top three priorities over the next three to five years. I, at this point, would go through as far to say is I have little interest in going after the relatively small amounts of paper, plastic, garbage, gas, and, and, and cans left in the residual waste stream. I would much prefer to concentrate our fire, our collective organizational fire, as it were, and our efforts at tackling the 52,000 tons of food waste that remain in the residual waste stream. And the reason being is this. Next slide, please, David. This is the same table, but converting tonnages to costs of disposal for 2021. 20, um, and you can see, again, of the stuff that's left in our residual waste stream that we could reduce or recycle, um, whilst the total cost of that at, at last year's prices was nine and a half million pounds, almost six million pounds of that is food waste. So that's where we need to concentrate our efforts going forward. I think that's quite a stark figure. David, next slide, please. And just to, again, try to illustrate that in a way that, that lands and, and highlights the size of the challenge here. This is the same information I've just been talking about on the last few slides, but put in a graphical stacked um, bar form. The bigger green element at the start there is food waste, and the other elements are all the other different materials. And you can see the food waste far outweighs the other elements. And this is actually a combined graph that takes into account both households and flats. Where, where the story is almost exactly the same. Food waste is our biggest challenge. And if you take away just one thing from tonight, it's the fact that we must, must, must start driving down the amount of food waste in our residual waste stream. Next slide, please, David. So how can we reduce it? And here I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Helena Jackson. Thank you, Duncan. So to reduce waste with whichever um, material you're looking at. This uh, we've taken as the role of a waste aware. And waste aware is the outreach arm of the Hertfordshire Waste Partnership. And uh, the three of us, David Duncan and myself, work together with the officers um, across the County Council as well as each of the local authorities to communicate um, a, the work of the partnership. We have an ambitious work program which um, I will give you a flavor of um, a second is sort of our, in our current priorities. Um, but the outreach is shared in person um, at events online, events such like this via newsletters, social media, our webpage, um, leaflets, although slightly less so now, lots of different ways that we're trying to just share that message so that we can help to affect behavior change because that really is our best hope of reducing the waste in the first place. David, if I could have the next slide, please. So I'm going to dip into food waste. Um, as you've heard from Duncan, this really is um, a key focus for us. Nearly one quarter of the refuse bin is avoidable food waste. So we made the decision to have this as our focus for the next few years. There, there's many other projects we're doing, but this is a key one. And Waste Aware, along with colleagues at um, a new team within the County Council called Sustainable Hertfordshire, we're working together and we're developing a new campaign aimed at reducing that avoidable fraction. So it's not focusing on recycling food. This is about avoiding it, stopping it getting wasted in the first place. 
And we're looking to um, encourage people to buy only what they need and then obviously to use and to eat what they buy. We're using the waste composition analysis from 2020, which Duncan outlined as our baseline. And then at the end of our campaign um, period, we will then review, um, another, we'll carry out another waste composition analysis and we will identify the difference. And hopefully that food waste figure in the residual bin will have gone down. So what have we done to date? Well, February, 2022, so earlier this year, we shared a survey to launch this initiative. And we asked Hertfordshire residents about their food buying, storing and wasting habits. This survey was shared largely online. Um, we posted about it on social media, our web pages, our e-newsletter um, and through council colleagues. But we realised not everyone is online. So we also shared it um, around all of the libraries within the county and all of the county reception areas. And obviously, if you emailed in, we would make that available. We gained a whopping response, 3,249 responses. And this is an, a record for a, a social survey within Hertfordshire. So we were thrilled and we can clearly see from that that this is a topic that captures everyone's hearts. So the survey was analysed. There were lots of free text boxes allowing people just to offer what they wanted. So it did take quite a while to analyse, but there was a huge amount of useful information in there. And we managed to group those results into three broad issues, which I will come on to shortly. We are now at the stage where we're going to be developing some trial interventions, which um, is ways in which we are asking people to reduce their food waste. Um, these are going to be ev evaluated in a trial district um, and then eventually they will be promoted across the county. David, next slide, please. So why are we going to do it across the county? Um, this slide shows you the difference between that avoidable food waste in blue and the unavoidable food waste in orange. So this is very similar to what Duncan was saying, but even the best performing councils, so St Albans, that fourth line down, um, as well as Three Rivers, which is the second line down, though those two authorities are within the top five of, the UK, of England. Um, they recycle more than many other, or pretty much everyone else within um, England. But even so, they have a huge amount of avoidable food waste. So significant gen uh, quantities are there, regardless of where you live, the recycling system um, that is in your area. It, it's sort of across the board. Next slide, please, David. So what did the survey show? five top reasons that people fo throw food away. There's nothing really groundbreaking, but it does reinforce um, other campaigns that have looked at food waste reduction and really gives us that key focus um, for our campaign. So number one, food has reached its use by date. So this is simply people aren't eating it in time. I say simply, the reasons for those are very varied um, and it changes day by day. So it might be that you've got another activity to do or you changed your mind or someone else came over. There are so many different reasons that you didn't um, eat that in time. The second one there, we find stuff in the fridge or freezer or cupboards which has been forgotten about and then gone off. So this is more to do with kitchen management. The third one, we didn't eat the leftovers that we'd saved. So people here have the intention to reduce that food waste, but it's now a planning issue. Number four is storage. Um, food wasn't stored properly and gone off. So that might be something to do with the information on um, what might be a, a more preferable location or method of storing th those items. And then number five is more food was brought in than we could eat. And this is to do with purchasing and shopping, but also a little bit of planning. So although those, those reasons might be quite familiar to you, the underlying reasons of how we can change that behaviour is really quite complex. So after the survey, we wanted to look at that in more detail. So David, the next slide, please. And we took it to a focus group. In fact, several focus groups, some online and some in person. We wanted to find out more about these behaviours and what leads to them. Um, and the questions were devised to really probe more into these areas that were identified during the social survey. It, we encouraged a lot of open discussion to really understand people's views and experiences on these food wastes. And we looked at the different stages that can lead to food waste. The pre-shopping, so before you even get to a shop, what are you planning on buying? How much of it? Um, have you looked in your cupboards or fridges to see what is already there? 
the shopping, um, what is it that you're buying? Are you tempted by those offers? And then post shopping, where do you put the food? Um, what do you cook? Do you cook your leftovers, um, et cetera? And we had some really fantastic insights from these, as well as some of the suggestions that we'd actually not thought of. So it was really useful. But interestingly, there were four different focus groups and we saw quite a lot of repetition across those four groups, which is excellent to confirm again where to focus our efforts. Thank you, David. Now I said that we identified three key issues and these are them, awareness, skills, and lifestyle. Awareness. So this is things like people are not aware that the waste, the food that they waste links to climate change. Um, those processes that David talked about at the front, at the beginning of the session um, and the methane it produces. People maybe um, don't know about the cost and that figure that Duncan shared, 800 pounds a year, could be thrown away, the food that you've bought and not eaten. And just the sheer amount of food that's being wasted. It's very easy, sort of a, a small little bit of leftover on your plate and just put that in the bin. But when you, when you add it up, um, and what Duncan was saying again about if you have three bags of shopping, it's essentially one of those going straight into the bin. I mean, there's a staggering amount of waste and it might be that people just simply aren't aware. Moving on to the second box there, skills. This could be to do with shopping tips, like writing a shopping list, meal planning, how surprisingly over lockdown, um, RAP, so the Waste and Resources Action Programme, they, they do quite a lot on um, maximizing the use of food. And one of the things that they found was that freezer tips was really sought out. People weren't sure what could be frozen or how long for or how to defrost it. So it's just simply sharing those skills. And then moving on to lifestyle. We want to make any of these changes easy. We know that people are busy. We know that um, it can be seen as a very difficult thing. So when over lockdown, we did have a little bit more time, people did manage their food better. Obviously, there's a little bit about not being able to go out as much and, and concerns about how much food is coming in. But people looked after their food more because they had the time to do so. So it might be just that perception of not having enough time, or it might be that actually time is much more limited. So how could you cook? Um, it's something that we're not actively taught in school anymore. So we need to learn through doing. So it might be some um, cooking demonstrations or recipes, as well as making sure that we cater for all different tastes, um, including allergies or dietary requirements. Thank you, David. So what are we gonna do next? We are creating those in interventions at the moment. Um, I mentioned earlier that we are starting in one district and we had a look at the, um, all of the districts in, in the county and we asked um, the geodemographic geo department to identify which were most similar so that we could do the trial and a pilot and then compare. So we decided on three rivers as our pilot with Hartsmere as our pilot. Sorry, so Three Rivers were doing the interventions and in Hartsmere we're doing nothing. We will then undertake um, a waste composition analysis at the end in both districts and we will look at those differences. And hopefully there'll be a lot less food waste in Three Rivers. Um, so what is it that we're likely to be doing? Well, certainly we'll be sharing information about the impact of food waste on climate change um, and it's very, very definitely um, the economics of it so that the money saving as the food um, prices increase. Food management skills, how to look after them in your kitchen um, and what to buy, making sure that you check before you go out. And there's various different apps that are available that might help with that. And then cooking techniques. Um, not entirely sure exactly how we're going to be doing that, but we are meeting soon and we're going to really get into de detail about all of the things that we've discovered on this journey so far. And then we're going to be going um, out and about. We want to reach as many people as we possibly can with these messages. We will make sure, obviously, and you'll see in a minute, uh, Waste Aware is very good at doing good graphics. Make sure that they are um, engaging and that people want to see what we're sharing. Um, we're going to use some normative messaging, which is something, again, that's come out of RAP, which is showing that this is something that everyone's doing, that you're not going to be the odd one out if you're eating your leftovers. We're going to make sure that this is something that becomes the norm. 
And we, I in particular love events. I like getting out there and speaking to people face to face. It's wonderful we can do that again. But we need a draw. We want to say this is something that's important. It's interesting and it's easy and it's fun because we all know that cooking can be fun. Um, and you may well not have known before you joined us this evening that food waste was such a big issue. And really it is the elephant in the room. So we're going to capture that and we are going to have what we are hoping and thinking of doing is um, a giant elephant that we can have out on the road with us at different events, in the park, outside shopping centres, wherever it might be, as a, a visual focus to get people engaged and draw them in to, to talk to us so that we can then share um, our messages. So watch this space. Uh, we're not entirely sure yet how it will be, but we, we launched um, in Three Rivers a couple of weekends ago, talking to some of the community leaders about how we can really reach out to residents. Um, and again, that will all be thrown into the pot, excuse the pun, um, so that we will find out exactly what those interventions are um, and go from there. Thank you, David. So that's food waste. What else does Waste Aware do? We have many other campaigns. One of them, um, again, looking at the composition of the residual bin is disposable nappies. And you might be surprised that on average, it takes up 8% in our residual bin. And obviously not all households are producing disposable nappy waste. So in those families that are, there, um, it's clearly a, a huge proportion. Reusable nappies are readily available. They are easy to use. Um, but not many people know about them. Or some people are a bit nervous about how to use them. What about leaks? What do I do with them? So we have launched um, an incentive in late 2020 um, where we are partnering with nine different suppliers and offering 15% off the purchase of reusable nappies and accessories. Um, we've had almost a thousand families register their interest to date and over this time we have seen more than 300 households spend over £20,000 in the scheme that's buying um, reusable nappies. Um, we can assume that they're going on to use them and we have a survey out at the moment with those families to find out exactly what they think of the nappies, what they think of the scheme um, and crucially, are they using them? We're not necessarily advocating using dispose, uh, reusables the entire time because we know it has to be practical. So um, a, a mix. So if you're out and about, you might want to stick with your disposables, but when you're at home, reusables are really great. So that's one of our campaigns. David, next one, please. There are many more. Now it's going to be a quick fire click. So David, one more click, please. Oh, <laughs> and back oh, again. Sorry. <laughs> so I've just got a load of images. If you can go back one more, please. Thank you. Um, so we largely focus on covering the three R's, reducing, reusing, recycling, but increasingly we're looking at the first two, reduction and reuse. Our web pages are very busy with many visiting to find out details about the county's recycling centres. Um, and here, this is obviously green waste being put in the recycling centres. Um, so that's the recycling element, as well as, next click, please. Other way. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. Recycle Right. So this is a campaign that we launched about five years ago to try and encourage everybody to remember the basics. So keep it right, keep it clean and keep it empty. This is the recycling that goes in your bins at home. Um, and if in doubt, leave it out so that we only put in what we know can be recycled. Next, please, David. Litter. This was a big one over um, lockdown, over the pandemic, with a huge number of um, disposable PPE being discarded. But we also get involved in um, nationwide spring cleans. So the Great British Spring Clean is a lovely one that happens. Uh, we've just finished it actually. So um, April, May time each year, which we encourage, we have most of the districts have litter picking equipment that can be given out for free and we encourage residents or um, local groups to go and litter pick. So if you've been involved in that, thank you very much. Next, please. Compost, very important. This is obviously something that everybody can do at home. You can include your food waste if you have any. This is largely about the unavoidable um, food waste. 
And as David said earlier, there are many compost giveaways. We also offer a buy one, get one half price offer on compost bins. So if you are in the market for a compost bin, go and have a look at our website to find that deal. Next, please. Reusable nappies, as I've already said, they really are lovely to use and it's a nice way to get children involved. They tend to feel a little bit more aware of what's happening. So um, it can then also assist with potty training, which is clearly no bad thing. Thank you, David. Now, this is a new scheme. Um, sustainable swaps here relates to period products. And this is an offshoot of the Sorry, that's under, underselling it vastly. Um, it's related to the nappy scheme in that there is a similar offer. We have partnered up with suppliers to offer the 15% discount because um, disposable sanitary wear is a really big problem. Um, obviously there is plastic in there, but it is also being washed up on our beaches. It is clogging up our drains and there are health implications as well for using those products. So this is a new campaign that was only launched in March this year, sharing um, the different types of reusable products that are available and trying to encourage people to start just talking about the issues with um, the mainstream disposables. Uh, there are three parts to the project. So one is this 15% discount. The second is that we are offering training to schools so that teachers can then be informed for when they're teaching about menstruation and periods in school. And we're giving everyone, a, a, each school that undertakes the training, we're giving a kit of these products so they can have them there um, to show to the pupils. And the third area is um, period poverty. We know that although the 15% offer is great. Not everyone can afford these products. So for those that are in need, we are endeavoring to provide some products for free. This is something we haven't yet launched, but we are looking at how we can do this discreetly to make it um, appropriate for those uh, that will seek these products. Um, and this is something that will be launching fairly soon. So watch this space. Um, and I'll be sharing some links later. So if you wanted to find out more about any of these schemes or even to apply, then you can do. Next, please, David. Moving on to textiles now. Um, fast fashion is a real issue and there are mountains of textile waste. So we hold a series of clothes swaps um, which invites people to bring in up to 10 items of good quality clothing and they can swap them for free with other items that people have brought along. And our next one actually is um, also part of Sustainable Suburban Suspest and that's happening on the 28th, which is two Saturdays time in St Albans. Um, and I have a link for that should you wish to attend later. Thank you. They're vastly popular events, actually. They are very, um, lots of good fun. One of the good ones to, to work out. Um, here, um, it, it looks very similar to Sustainable Swaps, but this is now moving onto our social media. So this is just a look at our Facebook page. And um, we have an excellent coordinator of social media who puts up some really engaging posts. And if you're not already following, I would um, encourage you to do so. Next, please. This is Instagram, which is quite new for us. Um, it's been, I think late last year we joined Instagram, but we are um, getting quite a lot of followers, quite a lot of engagement. Um, and as you can see, grouped there with the green images in the white circles, we have grouped our campaigns um, so that if you wanted to find out a lot more about, for example, food waste, that's where you can go. And then we are also active on Twitter. Um, which is obviously the standard Twitter um, format. Thank you, David. This is an example of some of the national campaigns that we get involved in. So this is the Great Big Green Week, as I mentioned, but there's also Recycle Week, um, Reusable Nappy Week. I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of them and we try to get involved in as many as we possibly can. So Sussfest is clearly a local one that we love um, and we have yeah, many others coming up. But if you keep um, an eye on us on social media, you can find out information or, next slide, please. Oh, this is social media, there we go. So just engaging posts, we want it to be um, really accessible for everybody. And then we also have um, 
an electronic newsletter which is sent to your emails which is sent out once a month and that also covers the um, the different events we're doing all of our campaigns um, and quite often some news articles that might be relevant and again i will share a link to if you wanted to sign up to that thank you david so this um, is a view of our website there are lots of buttons so that QR code there is for the newsletter. Um, I don't know how visible that is on um, this kind of screen. But then our um, website there, you've got lots of the different buttons with all of the key things that you might want to be finding out about. Um, mainly it's the recycling centers and the opening times and locations. But if we have the next click, if you scroll down the page, you then get to our news and campaigns. And if you click um, to the right slightly and that black box, you will get a list of all of our different campaigns and you can scroll through at your leisure. Thank you very much. I will now move on to um, Duncan again, um, because it's, it's not just this evidence-based work that we do, um, it's also, something that we're in, increasingly engaging in is contributing to policy debate around waste, um, calling on our experiences and how we can um, really inform government policy. So I will let Duncan explain. Okay, thank you, Helena. So I mentioned um, during my previous contribution to the presentation tonight that um, the government was getting close to implementing its resources and waste strategy. Um, the strategy was published um, back in December 2018. It's the first new national strategy um, for um, just over 10 years. The last strategy prior to that was 2007. And it's something we desperately needed in our sector to help define how we go forward. The strategy has three key elements, uh, extended producer responsibility. That's where we're looking to make producers of packaging, uh, financially responsible for the stuff that goes into the post-consumer waste stream. Uh, consistency, this is a, a, a very important element of the government strategy. Uh, the short version is, is that the government has quite rightly, in my view, become completely fed up with local authorities having a different range of materials they collect simply because you've crossed the border on a map. And therefore they will mandate a core set of recyclables, including food waste, that all local authorities will have to collect, um, um, start collecting within the next few years. Um, and then a possible return to a deposit return scheme. This is that old scheme that some of you in the audience, I certainly can remember taking glass bottles back to my local corner shop to get five or 10p back. Um, the government are proposing to bring this scheme back of a fashion. So I'm just gonna quickly take you through the latest developments. Um, between them, though, these, uh, well, I will say these three particular uh, work streams, these three main work streams from the Resources and Waste Strategy represent the biggest sector change in over 30 years. You have to go back to the Environmental Protection Act 1990 to see changes as big as this, and these are bigger. And before that, the 1974 Control of Pollution Act. So we are really talking about a, a once in a generation change that is looking to move the entire sector onwards. And the government started by releasing its response to the EPR consultation um, in March this year. We were somewhat surprised. Uh, the responses to the three consultations, and there's been two rounds of national consultation involving thousands of man hours of work, uh, putting together uh, evidence-based uh, responses to something like 272 questions in the end, most of which require some sort of small essay to properly respond to. Um, the first round was in 2019. The second round was delayed by the pandemic that took place in 2021. And because of the overwhelming level of response, it's taking DEFRA uh, as a government department a lot longer to analyze and publish their response to our responses. The next stage on from this is draft legislation, which we expect to see towards the end of this calendar year, royal assent in early 2023, and then implementation starting to kick off on a phase basis. So I, will, I want to quickly take you through the EPR consultation and where it's actually touched on consistency and DRS, because there are some common areas. So the response released in March, on the 26th of March, 2022, I think it was a Saturday, which was rather curious. Um, but this response set out the government's final policy and delivery decisions following three years of consultation. 
Uh, the responses to consistency in DRS themselves are not expected until um, uh, later this month, but probably will now, based on latest intelligence, slip until uh, sometime in June. Um, EPR, extended producer response to So at the moment, post-consumer packaging, the management of that in either the residual waste stream or the recycling waste stream is a local authority cost. It's a cost to the taxpayer. It's a cost to you and me. EPR proposes... Uh, or the EPR system when implemented will transfer that cost from the public sector to the private sector. To give you a Hertfordshire example, uh, Tesco's is a Hertfordshire based company headquartered in Welling Hatfield. Uh, and somewhere very deep in their notes to their accounts, there'll be a description about their packaging compliance costs, which currently are probably around 15 to 20 pound a ton in common with other major uh, retailers, wholesalers and producers. Once EPR hits the statute books and, and, and as a system is implemented, that compliance costs will probably go north of £120 a tonne. That will do one major thing. So what's happening now is that the research and development, sorry, the finance director at Tesco's is urgently in conversation and has been for some, some probably 18 months now with the research and development director uh, looking at all the packaging that they handle as a supermarket and are responsible for placing on the market with one uh, simple objective, minimize it where possible, where possible, get rid of single use packaging forms, not just plastic. Everyone focuses on plastic, but not just plastic. Uh, and as quick as we can start to migrate towards different packaging methods. So reusable packaging, refillable packaging. Um, to try and minimize their long-term costs. So EPR as a system will kick off in April 2024. Uh, and we, and in that first year will be based on the amount of packaging they place on the market. But from April 2025, uh, the contributions that the producers will make into a central pot, which local government will then apply to, will be based on the complexity of their packaging. The idea is quite deliberately to then penalize those forms of packaging which are very hard to recycle because they may be made of three or four different types of packaging in one structure, making them tetra packs being the classic example. Whereas easier to recycle packaging will receive a relatively lower modulate, what we call a modulated fee. The scheme administrator will be a public body. Um, the government are currently working how, be how, how best for it to be organized, whether it will be part of a, an existing government department or a standalone body. But importantly, it will be a public body and therefore uh, the degree to which it will be influenced by private sector will be minimized. And this aligns with some clear red lines that the Harvard set down in both its responses to um, the consultations. Local authorities via the EPR scheme administrator are set to receive the full net cost recovery of, of any costs incurred in relation to handling packaging waste, whether it's in the recycling stream or the residual waste stream. In practice, we will be paid once a quarter and in arrears. So things like composition analysis, whilst they may seem somewhat a little dull and academic, all of a sudden become extremely important because that's what helps us to determine how much packaging we're actually handling. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned that the EPR consultation response crossed over into some areas to do with DRS and consistency. So we know now, by virtue of reading the EPR response, that an English depository term scheme will not will not include glass bottles or jars. And again, this is aligns with the HWP's response. You might recall from my section on waste composition, we capture 92.5% of the glass uh, um, put out into the waste stream. The DRS target for England and for the devolved administrations is 90%. And therefore, when we um, responded, we suggested that it made little sense, at least in Hertfordshire, to back a system that was going to represent potentially billions of pounds worth of investment when we were already achieving a capture rate above that being targeted by the scheme. However, somewhat surprisingly, because waste is a devolved matter, we know that glass um, will feature in the Scottish DRS, which is due to launch now in July next year. And therefore, we think this is setting up the potential for a further clash between government policy and the producers and the manufacturers. Because if you think about how these things are gonna be labeled, all of a sudden you'll have warehouses close to the borders. We'll have a corner for the Scottish can going to um, retail outlets in Scotland 
and the English corner where it's a slightly different label because, um, sorry, glass bottle, um, where glass doesn't feature in, in the DRF. So we actually think um, there's further work to be done on this. However, in England, it will be an all-in scheme uh, for containers between 50, mil, uh, 50 mils and three liters covering plastic bottles and canned drinks. However, we are again concerned about the wording in the legislation because it's very, very easy for a manufacturer to make a bottle that is 49 mils and therefore technically would not fall foul of the DRS obligation. So we expect to be working further with the government to make sure the wording of this legislation prevents the creation of any loopholes. Again, in line with Hertfordshire's response, we lobbied hard for this. Um, all, all packaging that is currently described as biodegradable and compostable <coughs> will be labelled under a new national labelling scheme as non-recyclable. Very short version, biodegradable plastics is no good in the dry recycling stream or in the compostable stream and neither is compostable packaging. Um, it tends to create lots of problems, lots of confusion and as a result, lots of contamination. And therefore, as we already do in Hertfordshire, when we see spurious claims on packaging with respect to its recyclability, we often, um, if time allows, we will go into the correspondence with producers to get them to change their advice. And we're glad that the government have taken our advice on this matter, along with uh, our colleagues across the country, and have agreed to our recommendations to describe this as non-recyclable going forward. Partly in line with um, the HWP response, we had lobbied as part of our response for um, a, a dedicated DRS for single-use coffee cups, which are uh, the, the subject of many emails that we get on a regular basis. Um, the government's response to this was that they're going to mandate an in-store take-back, which we think is just as good at the end of the day. It still relies on consumer participation, but we, we believe having a mandated take-back scheme will force people to look again at the reusable and refillable forms of uh, uh, beverage packaging. Next slide, please. So uh, for the last few slides, I want to hand back to uh, my colleague, Helena. Thank you very much. So this has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour of what the Hearts Waste Partnership offers. There is more. And so every year we compile an annual report. Um, the latest one is available online. Um, and this, what's listed there is just um, a snapshot of what is contained inside it. It's quite a lengthy report, but that's because we do so much. Um, it really is quite an interesting read. And if, if you've um, found what we've said here tonight is something you'd like to know more about, then please do download it and um, have a look. I am just about to share a load of links um, and you have then access to um, the link for the PDF here as well. Um, but there is also a short URL on the screen there. And then finally, please, David. Um, one of the things that we really love doing is going out and talking to people about waste. Um, it is not a dry subject, as I hope you have understood tonight. There is a huge, much, a huge amount in there and it really does matter. Um, now that we're able to, and actually during um, lockdown, we did quite a few online um, talks and we are very happy to either come out in person or um, continue online um, giving talks about any number of topics, um, whether that's a general what is in your bin or very specific about different um, either materials or different locations. That's something that we have capacity for. We do ask for a minimum of about 20 people. Um, but if you would like to, to book that, then please get in touch with um, any one of us and um, our details are there. And I think that brings us to the end of our prepared slides. There are quite a few questions that have um, been raised, which is wonderful. Thank you very much. So I will go through them in turn from the top um, and we will endeavour to answer as much as we can. If there are other questions, please do add them. Um, hopefully we'll get time, but if we don't, we will always be able to then offer a written response afterwards. So first up, Waste Warriors was set up to educate the public about food waste as a collaboration between North and East Hearts councils and Garden Organic. Recently, the councils have pulled out of this agreement. Do you know why? And I will defer to my colleagues to answer this one. Oh, Duncan, you, oh, let me just unmute you again, sorry. Thank you, Helena. Um, I believe it's simply that the contract has come to an end. 
Um, I believe the initial contract was for 12 months and it came to an end um, at the end of March this year, which is why it's no longer being provided. However, I'm happy to take that away and double check it to make sure my information is accurate. Thank you. Um, the next question about climate change impacts. The presentations have outlined quantities of waste in terms of tonnages and percentages by mass and the associated costs. In future, could the amounts be expressed in terms of carbon emissions to the atmosphere? And it yes. says that this would probably reinforce the message about food waste. Um, happy, to, happy to do that. Um, I'd have to say for a lot of audiences, such metrics probably wouldn't land very well because it's hard to conceptualize those, but I'm very happy to take that on board as a suggestion. And if we can do that in some sort of peer reviewed way, um, then yes, uh, I, I think that would be a good addition to any future talks. Thank you for suggesting it. Helena, can I suggest we just go back to Doug because I see her hands out. I think she's got a, a follow up question. Of course. Um, yes, thank you. Um, it was just that I trained as a waste warrior um, under that scheme. And um, we got an email uh, fairly recently from the garden organic person to, to, to inform us that the council had pulled out. It didn't sound as though it was a contract coming to an end. It sounded as, uh, as though it was a money problem. Um. Unfortunately, I was here from either authority to, to confirm that. What I'll do is I will take that away and we'll get you a written answer. Thank you. It's North and East Hearts. Yeah, yeah. Thank no you. Problem. And um, <clears throat> just coming back to the point on climate change and, and, uh, and the food waste, um, of course, the, the, the climate change impacts of producing food, which is not then consumed, can, can really only be realised if there are changes throughout the whole of the food supply chain, because the the damage is in the in the in the growing of the food, the 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 picking of the food, the labour that goes into that, um, preparing preparing the foodstuffs for sale, packaging it, transporting it, maybe by air freight, and then preparing it for retail. Um, that's where all the all the all the resources are, uh, are wasted if the food is then simply thrown away without even having been taken out of its packet and so um really the logic of our of our project is is um you know change in the entire food supply system and really um that that is ultimately and logically um the, the necessary sort of correlation to achieve the kind of um uh climate change impacts in uh, it, it, it will essentially be the, the 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 redirection of food to other areas who who need it more, um, or the or the use of land for different purposes that are less environmentally harmful than producing food which is then wasted. Thank you, David. I'm no, I'm just aware of the time. We've got one minute till nine. So if you do need to go, then please do. Um, the recording will be available. But for anyone that does want to continue, um, it would be really lovely if we could go through a few more questions. So the next one. Should we limit ourselves until 9.15 though, uh, uh, Helena, perhaps? Very sensible. Yes, let's do that. Thank you, David. So how much difference would it make if every household put all, hopefully much reduced, food waste into a food waste caddy for anaerobic digestion? In short, massive. Um, you know, remember that six million pound cost attached to food waste. What could six million pounds do for another service? Think of schools, for example. You know, what could six million down, pounds do for our schools department or, or our, uh, social service? Things that are much more important, frankly, than waste. So it would make a massive difference. And if we did put peer-reviewed carbon metrics against um, some of these challenges, it would probably make a massive contribution to um, trying to get the the public sector's operations, if I can put it that way, closer to a carbon-free provision. Um, but within that, the most important part of that, though, is avoiding it in the first place. That's where the biggest carbon gains are to be made, because not only uh, are you avoiding food waste, but to pick up David's last point, you're avoiding all those upstream costs, you know, the, the energy, the water that's involved in making this food, and then the energy and cost of transporting it to, to the point of sale. It would make a huge difference. And, and quite frankly, if we don't, going after the other dry recyclables becomes a little bit academic because we all get nowhere near our 2035 targets without solving this food waste issue. Thank you. The next question is, why was the much more generous free nappy scheme pre the 15% discount stopped? 
this, these much more generous schemes could be self-funding by reducing the amount of waste that of nappies that you would otherwise have. Helena, do you want to take that or do you want me to take it? Um, I'll, I'll, happy. I'm happy to take it. Okay. Uh, short, short version was, unfortunately, we can't fund every single scheme to a gold standard. Um, and in looking at things like officer time, officer capacity, available resources versus other priorities, um, food waste being one of those, we had to come up with a scheme that was um, going to be giving on a, provided on a self-funded basis. Uh, if anyone's ever looked at the costs behind real NAPI provision, they are self-funding on a personal basis. We, we do appreciate that you know pump priming is helpful in achieving that, but it was a, it's one of those stark realities that we face that we just can't fund every single initiative we want to do to the gold standard. Uh, one of the things that we had to look at was, was doing the, the reuse, reusable NAPI scheme a different way and I would suggest, given the, the numbers that we've achieved so far, we're well on the way to achieving a scheme that is just as good done a different way as the old one was. Thank you. It also means that the new scheme that officers who are spending time auditing um, and, and ensuring that, uh, you, you know, avoiding fraud and things like that with the, with the former scheme are now freed up to promote reusable nappies and engage in other campaigns. Uh, and not uh, not acting as some cost accountants, which was a corollary, unfortunately, of the previous scheme. And just to add to that, it has meant that we've done a, a huge amount more um, publicity for this new scheme than we were able to with the previous one. But of course, there will be some people that are always disappointed and we'd love to give out free nappies, but um, just not possible anymore. The next question is, what is <clears throat> keep it right usually understood to mean? So this is regarding the Recycle Right campaign, and it actually goes alongside the web page and a leaflet that we have um, specifying what we consider to be the right materials. So these are the desirable materials that we would like to be recycled, that are able to be recycled within our scheme. It doesn't necessarily refer to items that are recyclable, because obviously that is much more wide than we can recycle within the county collections, um, but that does go alongside. Um, our web pages. Next question is to promote home composting, why not give residents free compost bins made from the plastics you collect for recycling um, and advice on how to make them and compost? As per Diane's comments above, by the Waste Warrior Scheme, offering this sort of advice. Again, self funding by removing costs of dealing with garden waste and raw food waste. I'll take it, Helena. Um, I remember probably the summer of 95 was the first time I um, took over a Sainsbury's car park on a Sunday morning to give away 3,000 compost bins. Um, the, the kind of experience that I've had since then, backed up by colleagues across the country, is that if you give something away for free, people tend not to use it. Um, whereas pe if people are asked to make a small financial commitment towards, in this case, the purchase of a compost bin, they do tend to use it. Um, put another way, um, if, if we were to provide bins for free, I could get, I, I would, I would guarantee I could just about get a compost bin into every garden in the county. Six months in, I couldn't guarantee they weren't being used as, as a dog kennel or, or a toy store uh, if you give them away free. Um, so that's why we don't do that. We do ask the residents to make a small contribution. And in our experience, um, they end up, they tend to be used much more as a compost bin because someone has had to part with um, some money to do so. Thank you. Next question is about World Refill Day, which takes place on the 16th of June. Um, takeaway packaging is the focus of this. And the question is, what is, is Waste Aware doing anything for that? So Refill is um, a campaign which encourages us to reduce um, bottled water and instead bring our reusables and fill them up. Um, this year it is indeed takeaway packaging. Um, we will be promoting that on social media. And one of the links that I shared is to our Remember Your Reusables page. And on there, we do reference um, the refill app, the refill campaign, as well as a list of all of the refill shops that are now present that we're aware of in Hertfordshire. Um, and that is again, something that we'll be, that we'll be um, sharing. So yes, we're looking forward to it. Um, <coughs> And next question. Helena, um, Diane's got her hand yeah, up. I just noticed, thank you. Bear with me a second. Okay. Yeah, sorry, me again. Um, it's just that I lead Plastic Free Letchworth and we are joining in this refill day scheme 
this year and it would be nice if we could work with you. I've, I've asked Love Lecture and I've asked the council if they're doing anything, the local council, and they're not. Um, but so if you are, you know, if you know, if you send a promotion online, it would be good to work alongside. Um, last year, um, we did um, a, a picnic, a takeaway picnic in the town centre. Um, and encouraging um, local businesses to join in by, um, you know, um, filling people's box. If you take your own picnic box to the counter and say, can I have the quiche in that, please? Or, um, that's, that's what that was about. And we're just hoping to enlarge on that this year. So would it be possible to have a conversation, Helena, about this? If yes, I that's email lovely. Email you or something. Yes, very much. Um, thank you, Diane. That would be lovely. Uh, one of the other things that we are going to be sharing is um, obviously we've got the Jubilee weekend coming up. We're expecting many people to be going out and picnicking. And so we do have um, one of the features in my next um, with, um, rubbish and recycling newsletter is about um, takeaway containers and how you can make your picnics and eating out of the home um, more reusable. Uh, using more reusables so yes thank you we'd like to have that conversation just just on that for the audience um, david and helena between them kind of head up what i think is quite a formidable social media um uh, capability where we also we also get a number of other colleagues to help with that so if you've got local schemes like that where you you need a bit of help promoting them then you know drop helena david an email give us the details and we're more than happy to use our social media channels to help promote those initiatives um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's exactly the same sort of work that we, we do in, 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 on those issues. And therefore, we'd be more than happy to support any programs like that across the county. Yes, very much. So EPR is already happening via free recycling schemes offered through TerraCycle, which are fully funded by the brands that generate this waste. Um, so a plea to everybody, seek out your local TerraCycle drop-off point and find out what they accept. Sadly, waste do not list these drop-off points and what they accept, but they are available on the TerraCycle website and we thought there wasn't any um, need to repeat that. Yeah. And get more things recycled and paid for by the producers of that waste um, and it gen generates donations to charity. Yeah, just on that, um, the TerraCycle schemes typically go after materials that are not widely recycled, if at all recycled via typical curbside collections, and they are changing. So for example, the TerraCycle scheme uh, linked to the collection of soft flexible plastics um, is now coming to an end because most supermarkets across the country have soft plastic take back points. And one of the things we expect to be clarified by the government when they publish the consistency regulations and response in due course um, is whether or not the core set of materials are referred to in my part of the presentation, uh, will include soft plastics in future, i.e. so you can recycle them as part of your normal curbside pickup. So it is a form of EPR, um, but it's not the form of EPR that we refer to uh, in this presentation. And on to DRS now, why are there minimum and maximum criteria? JW, so I'm going to I'm going to venture. That's Mr. Webb. Good evening, Mr. Webb. I hope you are well. It's nice to see you in, in the audience, virtually. Um, DRS um, was originally an idea linked to what we call on the go. But what do we mean by that? So imagine you jumping on the train in the morning, going into London for your job. You get to the train station. You buy uh, some sort of beverage, water, a can of fizzy drink. Um, and you consume it and you and then you then throw away or recycle that that empty um, item. Um, that's what we refer to as on the go. And therefore, initially, for the DRS proposals, when they were first conceived, they looked at typical uh, container sizes for on the go material. But that has since morphed into an all in scheme with a bigger range and a much higher upper limit. Uh, which will also apply to multi-packs as well, because that was one of the big debating points. Um, whilst we've not seen the DRS response, it's clear from the EPR response that the government are committed to doing this, um, even though the four administrations are coming up with their own different, I think, ill-advised tweaks to it. So I suspect there will be further work between the four administrations to come up with uh, a uniform screen that applies to the UK as a whole, because they will be under severe, understandable pressure to do so from the private businesses that will have to fund this. 
Thank you. And then we have a little bit of feedback on uh, from somebody who has read the annual report, which says it's an excellent read, graphical and informative. So thank you for that. Nothing seems to have been said about getting recyclable food waste out of black bins so that it can at least be recycled. So this is where we, we were talking in the presentation about the number of authorities that um, collect food waste. So currently seven of the 10 boroughs do so. You might remember that graph where there was a bar missing from Watford and Well and Hatfield because of the timing of the study. Um, as part of the consistency regulations, the government will mandate the collection of separate food wastes on a weekly basis. So residents in Hartsmere, East Hart and Stevenage or will receive a food waste collection. We believe at some point in 2025 will be the mandated date. We don't know if that's 24-25, i.e. by the 31st of March, or whether that's going to be 25-26, i.e. the 31st of December. But sometime in 2025, we, well, we expect when the regula regulations come out later this year, the key date will be a deadline sometime in 2025 for all local authorities that don't currently uh, provide separate food waste collections to have to do so. And those same regulations will apply to commercial and business waste as well. And Thank we you. should mention that alongside the avoidable food waste initiative, we also have uh, a separate initiative that wasn't tied to mention it this evening, but we have a separate initiative which is looking to encourage uh, residents not to put food waste in their residual waste bin through application of a simple sticker on the bin and other promotional materials to encourage people to, to make sure that they um, use their food waste service where it's provided um, for unavoidable food waste and you will recall from the presentation that there is there is a much significant presence of unavoidable food waste in the residual waste stream that emphatically should be going into the recycling scheme uh, and and um, you know we we re, we are chasing that down as well through a separate but related initiative. Thank you. The next question is something that we've been talking about internally recently, and that is: Are there any plans to incorporate the recycling of coffee pods? Who would like to take this? <laughs> um, uh, the matter, as Helen has indicated, is is the subject of much debate, and it ranges from practical acceptance that people will use that form of consumerism to the more um, the more fundamental should we be encouraging that sort of consumerism by providing a recycling service and, and I think the debate has some time to run yet um, physically coffee pods don't work with the existing system at all well because they've become they've become part of the industrial waste process at the sorting plant because they're just too small to work sensibly with it it's the type of uh, initiative where you'd want a TerraCycle type system. Uh, personally, not being a coffee drinker, I don't know why anyone drinks the stuff. Um, I'd like to see them done away with completely, but I'm, I'm one of the outliers in the debate. So we haven't yet come to a clear consensus. There are various press pressures in some councils to do something. And in other councils, members are taking uh, a principled stance against that type of throwaway consumerism. So. Yeah, we've not managed to resolve that one just yet. And, and, and just to, to add, I think, um, for, for, of course, extended producer responsibility will impact on these sorts of materials. And if they can't adapt to become readily recyclable, they'll become very expensive and the market will, um, you know, perhaps see changes in their production or they may, they may even become uneconomic to produce. The second feature is that what we're looking for is simplicity, simplicity for the residents, simplicity for our operatives and something which is technically possible at the sorting plants. And so, you know, it's really under extended producer responsibility. It's up to the manufacturers, not the councils, to show that their material can be handled. It, it, it can't be confused with something else. It's easy to handle. It's not something that's going to slip through somebody's fingers or go off the picking line at the, at the, at the, at the factory. And it's up to the manufacturer to do their due diligence with the uh, processing sector, with, the, um, with the, uh, the, the system that will put in place to manage extended producer responsibility and show how their, uh, their product, their coffee pot or whatever other esoteric product it might complies with the scheme. I think we've got time for one more, Helena. Oh, there are two questions left. The first okay. one, go on. I think it's a um, good one. 
So how can we move to a three weekly limited general waste collection with weekly recycling collection? Thus, people have no choice but to recycle. Unpopular, but it works. Look at Wales. Could councils not collect general waste bins containing recycling in the same way that recycling bins are not collected if they contain contamination? Yeah, great question. And I'm glad someone's raised it. Um, it's one of those um, areas where an apolitical stance from an officer in terms of recommendation makes a lot of sense, but becomes very political very quickly. Um, yes, it's worked in Wales. Well, but the relationship between the Welsh government and the Welsh local authorities is somewhat different to it is um, in England. Um, one of the things we expect to see specified in the consistency regulations is that the government will require, against advice I hasten to add, um, a minimum fortnightly collection for residual waste. And if they do that, if it's in the regulations, um, then we have no choice but to comply and we, and we won't be able to do it. However, one of the points that was made in our responses, when I say our, I mean the sectors, was that if you think about the bigger climate change picture, one of the biggest things you can do to decarbonize a waste system is drive less or train or boat less ton miles. If you can simply incur less mileage, you can transport the waste less um, then you can you can start to move towards a decarbonized um, system or you can start to reduce the carbon impact of your system. Three weekly re residual waste collections are one very effective way to do that. However, people say that. What would I want to do if I was if I had the green light from everyone above me to do that? Well, the first thing I'd probably be looking at doing would be to um, uh, get microchips in each, in each of the bins. Uh, these microchips don't tell you what's in the bin. They never have, they never will. They can't do that. They're not that sophisticated. But in line with a reader on a vehicle, they can tell you how often that bin is emptied. And I, and I raise that question because I think we'd actually find for a lot of people, we're much closer to a three-week collection in terms of optimizing our system than we currently think we are. But you can imagine the scare stories in some of the Taliban press about, you know, local government spying on its residents. And it's ridiculous. And I'm not going to get into that bait tonight. So I think as officers, we see the argument around three week collections. And I absolutely do agree with the point that it basically forces people, people to, to pull their finger out. Um, and I have no issue with that. That's what fortnightly collections have done. They, a lot of people that were, were on the edge of being interested suddenly became interested because they knew they couldn't get rid of their refuse uh, once a week. And for those same reasons, you, that's why you're seeing the government about to legislate to make the provision of food waste a separate weekly collection service. So um, depending on what those regulations say, um, will determine, at least in England, whether or not we can go down that route. But thank you for that question. I'm conscious of time, so I'd just like to end on one, one point. Um, we always enjoy, enjoy doing these things. Um, we love getting out talking to, to the residents that we serve. This presentation goes down a lot better in person. So if, just to emphasize the last slide that Helena had in the presentation, if you are part of any additional residents associations, environmental groups, I don't care what group it is, we would love to come and talk to you in person. We, we, you know, as Helena said, we do ask for a minimum of 20 people because when we come out, that's an environmental and financial cost to us coming out to do so, not to you, to, to the authorities that we work with. Um, and if we're going to incur that environmental and financial cost, and do it in person, let's get a, a decent amount of people in the room. But like I say, we are more than happy to do that. We, we enjoy it. Um, I think the last in-person presentation was one David and I did um, in the, I want to say the railway inn, that's probably not right, the railway arms in Harpenden um, some weeks ago, which went down extremely well. And if you're part of any such group, please, please invite us along. Thank you. So um, just a very final plea. Um, I was going to do it, but uh, Caroline's beat me to it. Um, as part of SUSFEST, obviously this is why we're here, there is um, a feedback form. The link is there, so please give your feedback about our event. And I am also just sharing a link to um, the Sustainable St Albans webpage so you can see what other events are on. Remember, we have our clothes swap coming up on the 28th, and there is a link um, also further up to... to um, attend that. I will follow up with an email to everyone who's registered so you haven't heard the last from me yet. Um, thank you for your kind comments. We hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much indeed for joining us.
Good night. Good night, Good night everybody.